All right. Good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you very much for uh, for coming to our training today. Uh, my name is uh, is Matthew Stith, and with me today is uh, is Tobias uh, Connect from uh, from Busix. Uh, I work for uh, for Rackspace uh, in their uh, in their anti abuse department, uh, doing abuse handling for Rackspace. Uh, also, I uh, am vice chair chairman of the board for MOG. And I also represent the uh, the hosting committee. Uh, so today uh, we're we're going to be talking about uh, an abuse desk training. Uh, so here's here's the information that I already told you about Tobias and myself. Uh, and this is the agenda of what we're going to be talking about today. Uh, we're going to be talking about uh, an acceptable use policy, some some guidelines about it on how you can uh, build out your acceptable use policy making the case for your dedicated abuse desk, building processes, and then getting started with abuse handling. So first, uh, first thing I wanted to ask uh, out of the room, uh, how, many, how many of you have an acceptable use policy published with the, uh, with the business that you're working with today? Just a, a raise of hands. Okay. Uh, yes. Uh, and, and also, uh, during this training, if anybody does have a question, I encourage you to ask the questions. I don't want to wait until the end till we, uh, till we move past some of the material so we can make sure that everybody is able to get out what they need to get out and get the questions answered as soon as we can so we're not in completely different material and then talking about something different and then generating confusion. So. Uh, your acceptable use policy when you develop it for your company, it's put in place to protect the company first and foremost and also to protect your customers. Uh, you don't, want, you don't want, the, uh, want your acceptable use policy to look like something that is non-attractive to the people that you want doing business with you. You really want that in place to deter uh, malicious parties from wanting to sign up with your service. Uh, and it takes a little bit of finagling and a little bit of figuring out the right place to get this in, in line. It is a legal document that you want to have prominently uh, displayed somewhere on your web page so people are able to find it easily, reference it easily. Uh, so. An important thing, there are many acceptable use policies out there that have language in them that couldn't possibly be enforced. Uh, there's sometimes where there's, there's an acceptable use policy out there. I'm not going to name names with, uh, with some of these, but there's an acceptable use policy out there that just says no profanity. How can you possibly enforce that on your network. Uh, people are going to say things in comments that are on people's web pages. Uh, somebody may just have something in an article that may be profane. And also, profanity is something that is a kind of a judgment case. Some people may think some words are profane. Some people may just think that this is just what everybody says every day. Uh, also, be, be sure that you make these policies specific to your network. Uh, there's, there's so many things happening out there on the, on the internet today, but it may not be what's happening at Rackspace may not be applicable to like a, a local web. Uh, they just, they'll have some similarities, but there's going to be things that are going to be specific to your network. and being able to speak to that and making sure that your, your users and your potential users and also more importantly your employees understand that this is these are the guidelines for our network and what we're seeing. Uh, try and make sure you have a, glo a global acceptable use policy. Uh, at Rackspace we at one point had an acceptable use policy for our cloud environment, for our mail environment, for our dedicated environment, for our, uh, our content delivery network, and for our transactional mail product. So it was five acceptable use policies that everybody was trying to figure out how to make all of these work. And you, you just run into the problem of you'll have, you'll have your support team 
get a, an acceptable use policy reference from one of the other products, and it will not be applicable to some of the things that are happening in, uh, in one of the other ones. For example, uh, with our hosted email platform, we had, uh, we had something regarding bulk mail, a provision against it, uh, because we don't want the, that, that mail platform to be used to send bulk mail. So we would have our support team reference this to people who had a dedicated server. A dedicated server can send as much email as they want as long as they're within line of the other pieces of our acceptable use policy. Uh, and finally, uh, don't make any modifications to your acceptable use policy within contract negotiations. You don't want to remove most of any of your language from your acceptable use policy because you're bringing more risk to your network. Now, that being said, if you do state things like cure time, uh, how long you're going to let somebody go until you suspend or terminate their service, you can make a concession there. So if you say you only have 48 hours to give us a response or we'll suspend your service. If you have a big enterprise that wants to come onto your network, you'll be able to change that number a little bit. But if they want to say, I want to get rid of the provision that says, do not send unsolicited email, that's just, that's a, it's a non-negotiable tack. Uh, you have to keep, you have to keep the language secure, but you can, change a little bit around it and also be, in, be very much in mind of when you're seeing a lot of requests to make a change to your acceptable use policy and it's almost always the same provision, it might be time to go back, revisit, and figure out what exactly, uh, what exactly should we be saying differently here. How should we be focusing on it in a different way? We don't want to completely get rid of the language because you know it may just be something that it's confusing to the customer. Uh, so when building your AUP, you don't need to reinvent the wheel. Uh, it's okay to it's okay to steal from Rackspace. Uh, you can go to our acceptable use policy. You can go to Amazon's web. Uh, Amazon Web Services uh, policy. Uh, you can go through all of these uh, all of these acceptable use policies that are out there, and be able to pull that information and understand that information. Uh, just don't completely copy it. It's kind of it, you know I've I've seen uh, some acceptable use policies out there where I was like I know I've seen this language before, and uh, they actually even forgot to remove Rackspace from their acceptable use policy. So it was a carbon copy of exactly what we had. Uh, and it was just weird. Uh, and going back to, uh, to talking about when you're talking about the exceptions, make sure that you make your language clear. Uh, you don't need to go for the complexity. You don't need to go for uh, as much information. You don't need to be exhaustive in your descriptions of things like spam. You can just have a definition of it, uh, how your company views what spam is. It doesn't have to be exactly what one company or another company says, it's what your company views it as. So again, it's always thinking about what is the, this is what's best for your company. Uh, and the length of the document. So Rackspace's acceptable use policy is about, uh, about two pages when, uh, when printed out. Uh, then you go look at somebody like like Amazon Web Services. I think that their AUP is, what would you say, 20, 20, 25 pages? And I understand why they did it. They just want to make it look as complex as possible so people just, you know, just glance over it. And then it may be something that it's, it's more or less they're trying to cover absolutely everything on their network. Absolutely everything. Uh, and sometimes you can do the coverage that you need with just a sentence and not three paragraphs or four pages of things. Uh, and you can, you can be, you can be generation is, is, uh, is beauty there. So 
I would like to ask Tobias to take me to a couple of websites so we can take a look at some some acceptable use policies. So the uh, the one that we spoke about yesterday, the the stack pack one. Okay. At this point, does anybody have any questions? Okay. Well, we'll we'll go ahead and pull this up, and we'll we'll take a look at it. There we go. Is it at the bottom of their page? Okay. Okay, so this is this is Stackpath's uh, acceptable use policy. Uh, so they're they're just more or less they they are very simplified in what they have in their acceptable use policy. They have what more or less I would call a a bare bones rep representation of the AUP. It's a good place to start. Uh, it'll it makes sure that you're you're covering the basics of your network. Uh, in my opinion, there are a couple of things that are missing. Uh, like one thing that we have uh, in the United States is we have an indemnification clause. So what that means is if a customer on our network has a malicious activity or a copyright or a trademark, as long as Rackspace brings that to the customer's attention and says this is a problem on our network, you need to fix this, you need to cure this, we have pulled ourselves out of the issue of being sued. So we can still be mentioned in a lawsuit, but what the indemnification means is any of the court fees or any of the legal fees that may happen as a result of us getting brought to court because of one of our customer's actions, our customer will be paying all of our legal fees. So it lets the customer realize I need to fix this, or I'm not only on the line for my company, but I'm also on the line for the company that is providing me the services. So that's that's one thing that is missing from, from theirs that is something that I would have added in. Uh, also, you could probably be a little bit more uh, descriptive in what you're putting in to some of this. Saying send spam uh, or spam message boards there's no real definition of what they determine what spam is, uh, so it's a little, a little nebulous uh, with it. So I was also going to bring up uh, Rackspace's acceptable use policy, if you could. Thank you. It should be at the bottom of the page. If it's not, that'll be embarrassing. Click on legal. And scroll down. No, it should be up there in the pages. Right there. Of course, you can't click on the hyperlink. So this is our global acceptable use policy. Again, I just want to show these things for reference, so you're able to just go back and look at these these acceptable use policies because there's hundreds, millions of them out there, and they're all varying degrees of success. So we go into a little bit more detail on things, and a lot of things that we have put in our acceptable use policy have come from learning the abuse issues that have happened in our environment. So we're able to say, we, we have something in there for uh, no live events. Uh, we ran into a, a, a nasty problem with uh, somebody who uh, was actually harming people and putting it onto the internet in a live stream. Uh, it did not look very good for us. Uh, and at that point we were just like, okay, we need to put that that piece in there. So it's that's when we're talking again to being specific to your network. Uh, you you're just you're going to find things that happen.
throughout the course of your your journey through solving the abuse problems on your network that are going to be able to uh, be added into this acceptable use policy. So that's that is a couple examples. So uh, we do have uh, at the at the end and provided within this presentation. Uh, there's a uh, there's a company called uh, called Spam House. Uh, I don't know if anybody knows of Spam House. Uh, there could be grumbles and cheers, whatever, in the room. Uh, but uh, they have a uh, an acceptable use policy generator. So what it'll do is it'll just you put in your company name, uh, and it will just generate uh, an acceptable use policy for you. I think it's a good start. There's some things in there that I don't agree with and uh, that that they are a little little weird about. But it's that's you know when you're building this, it's yours. It's your document. Uh, but it's a good place to start, and it's a good place to say if you want to if you want to build your AUP, you can just go in, put your company name in, click generate, and bring it to your legal team and say, how can we build this? to make it be applicable to our network. Uh, and also it's, uh, can you go to the next, no, I'm going to the next slide. I've got the button. Uh, so, you know, you can, you can generate one that way and also make sure that you reference what is out there. Uh, you can just go into uh, to Google and type in acceptable use policy and you'll just have millions of results for you. So. Uh, conduct a conduct a yearly review of your of your acceptable use policy, uh, and that's because things change throughout the landscape. Uh, abuse issues are always different. Uh, a few years ago, nobody had even heard of ransomware or uh, or Locky or things that are things that are popping up today, uh, and. Also, in the in the host sphere, or the uh, when you're hosting somebody's hardware or a server, uh, we've become a little bit more of a target uh, in re in regards of abuse because some of the other other companies out there, uh, your internet service providers and whatnot, have been able to put a little bit more control around their network with uh, with best practices, things like. Uh, um, Blocking 425, uh, and you know it's it's a uh, and that that again that's a case by case type of thing. It works very well for things like ISPs and uh, and in some cases on your hosting network to to block things like that. Uh, but when you're looking at hosting, blocking things like 425 is not the it's not a magic bullet for you. There's so much more that can uh, happen on your network and go wrong. Uh, and sometimes you may need to change your acceptable use policy outside of what your yearly review is because a huge issue could pop up on your network that's continuously causing you problems and you'll just need to be like, hey, legal team, we need to make this change as soon as we possibly can. You make that change, you get it published out, and you're good to go. Uh, finally, uh, with, with, the, with the AUP, uh, make sure that you put in language uh, that tells the customer that this is something that we will update on a regular basis. That we will, you know, and give them the ability, if they really don't like the change that was made, that they can opt out. Unfortunately, you're going to lose them as a customer, and that's something that can happen and that you really need to be cognizant of when you're making changes to your policies. Uh, you can make a change that could be detrimental to a to a customer. Uh, so it's always uh, always another good idea to look at what let's say your top 50 customers are doing on your network. Uh, have a good idea of what they're doing, and make sure that the changes that you're making to your acceptable use policy, as long as it's not something completely off to the off to the left for you that it's not going to impact your most critical customers on your network. So you have you have you've developed an AUP, it's beautiful, it's shiny, it's posted on the internet, people are going on to Twitter and Instagram taking pictures of it. Uh, and you know it's beautiful. So 
Now, what do you do as a company? You need to make a case for a, uh, for a dedicated abuse desk. And so that means you've gone to the legal team, you made them take all this time to build this AUP and pull all this stuff together, and they've probably spent money going to outside counsel, uh, and they're like, now you want more money uh, to make do, do what? Uh, so if you do have this AUP, you're, you're, gonna wanna, you're going to want to enforce it on the network. Uh, so the, the first part in making a case for a dedicated abuse desk is get numbers, get data. Uh, you want to be able to understand uh, what, the, what are the biggest problems that are happening on your network. So just a, just a question for the audience. Uh, uh, does, and I, I would love if just somebody could just yell it out. Uh, what's, a, what's a big problem on your network? Just anybody. No one? Come on, you got, somebody's got to have something on their network that's an issue. Hmm? Hmm? Uh, what, is, what, is a, what is the biggest uh, abuse problem that's occurring on your network? Spam? Okay, yeah, so you would want to gather all the data around what the problems are that, that you're experiencing with spam. So you would be looking at blacklists. Uh, you would be looking at uh, resource, uh, resource constraints because sometimes when you have somebody who has a giant spam relay happening on their network, it's putting a strain on some of your resources. Uh, you may just have somebody you know, fill, up, fill, up your, fill up your tubes. Uh, and uh, just gather those numbers around it. And, and you can also look at things uh, around, uh, around compromises that are happening, around fraud that's coming into your network, uh, and figure out like what are all of these things. Uh, and the, the impact to both your customers and your support teams, your, your engineering, your operations, because abuse affects both sides. Uh, of the of that network, uh, so focus on that most ur urgent issue. So spam is that issue. You don't want to look at every single thing of abuse that's happening and try and bring that to uh, to your your leadership. You want to be able to tell them spam is our biggest problem in our network. It's causing this, 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 and this. So blacklistings, customer resource overloads, and maybe an inbound. Uh, inbound DDoS is happening because somebody receives spam from this customer and they're mad at you so they're just going to attack your network and that also will bring the rest of your customers down. So when, when you're not able to serve all of your customers, you're going to start losing them. Uh, another, another thing that you can point out with uh, with a dedicated abuse desk is you can grow in the industry. Uh, you're able to go and make contacts, being able to talk with people behind the curtain of the other company that may be impacting you or you may be impacting them, uh, letting somebody know that I am working on this problem or, hey, we're seeing this problem from you, can you work on it? Uh, having that back channel resource is very powerful. Uh, and it helps you remediate faster and understand uh, a little bit more of what's happening on your network because you can sign up for all of the security feeds and all of the uh, um, feedback loop mechanisms on the, net, on, on the internet, but you still won't be seeing everything that's happening because some people just don't report back and other people have a tiny little server in their, in their home uh, and they just want to be able to, uh, they, they, don't, they don't have the time to, uh, to report. So they just end up blocking you or they report you to somebody who ends up blocking you. So having the, the communication aspect and knowing who to reach out to and when to reach out to them and what to tell them uh, is, is very powerful for somebody who's dedicated Within the within their abuse desk, you also have the uh, the opportunity for training. You're able to get certifications uh, and 
you're able to do how-to trainings, kind of like what we're doing right now. Uh, and it also helps with a positive reputation of your of yourself, of your company. And when you're able to have that dedicated abuse resource and continue to use it and start getting better at monitoring what's happening on your network and remediating uh, the problems that are happening on your network, uh, you're able to show that we have we have a good company. We are, we're able to stop abuse and and com combat it in positive ways. This is also twofold that you can have that acceptable use policy up, but the acceptable use policy at the end of the day is only words. Uh, to be able to actually take the action on it is is quite a different thing. And if you're taking those malicious parties off of your network and stopping that, the malicious parties are going to go somewhere else. Uh, it's it's always it's always a game of. Uh, of change with with these malicious parties coming on, but making sure that you're you're doing your best to stop them makes them go somewhere else. Uh, I've I've been able to see it firsthand in in what I've been doing at uh, at Rackspace. It's it's interesting, you know. You'll and it comes in ebbs and flows. You'll have uh, some some months that it feels like you're you can't do anything right. You can't stop anybody, but. Once you figure out what you need to uh, what you need to focus on, that's when you're able to make that uh, that stop. So, uh, also with uh, with making the case, you're able to make better uh, better expectations with your customers. So, not everybody reads the acceptable use policy. Somebody who's in a dedicated abuse team will know that that acceptable use policy from beginning to end. And they'll know all of the specifics around it, what everything means, uh, and you won't have uh, a, let's say, a salesperson bring on uh, somebody that is completely against what you want to do uh, on your network to keep it safe, to keep it protected. Uh, and that also goes to uh, to the training aspect. Uh, a, a dedicated abuse team can train support, can train sales. Uh, at Rackspace, what we do is we do uh, bi-monthly trainings with our sales team because they, we, we, we go through a few salespeople uh, and make sure that there's that one-on-one -on -one time and you go to your salespeople and say, what questions do you have? What, what are the most common things that are happening when you're working on a contract? Uh, and you're also, to show, you're also able to show them, here are some red flags. Uh, when when a when a customer comes to you and you know they they tell you what their business is and they're like okay we're a uh, we're a commercial marketing company we don't spam if somebody says they don't spam and they need to tell you that they don't spam they might be a spammer uh, so it, it's you know think thinking about the the red flags that are coming up when they're having these discussions it's also something that would happen with your support team uh, and you would also have this uh, this you would also give them key knowledge to the policy they don't need to know the acceptable use policy as as well as a dedicated team would uh, it's able to you're, you're able to just distill that knowledge down into short concise bullet points these are the things you should focus on. Uh, and so now, let's say you have that acceptable use policy written. Now you have one, two dedicated uh, abuse desk resources. Everything's going great. Uh, but there's, there's one other thing to think about, developing processes. Uh, what to do when a spam complaint go, comes in, what to do when you have a DDoS happening on your network, what to do when you find out that somebody has a phishing website or somebody has child exploitation material. It's very important to, uh, to have these type of guidelines, this type of process to understand this is how we, we're, we're supposed to go through the, the run book of a of an issue that's happening with a customer or with the network, uh, and you don't need to have a process for absolutely everything 
that comes into your network because then you'd probably come in and start just writing processes every day. Uh, you'd have thousands of, of these documents that are just, this is the process for us going A to B to figure out how to uh, close out this issue. Uh, when building a process, uh, you need to focus on simplicity. There's, there's some things that you should have in your process and some things that you don't need to have in your process. Uh, and you know we're, we're going to get to the point where we're actually going to build a process here. Uh, and it should be something that's easily repeatable. Uh, focus on, uh, on a beginning, a prefabricated response, something that you're able to just grab from a, grab from a document and put into the ticket. And it will, it'll just be something where the message will always be the same going to any customer. So everybody will know eventually, okay, this is the spam tickets that, uh, that we send to our customers. So they, they know this is what the process is. Uh, keep, the, keep the process in-house. Uh, you're able to share some of the details with your, with your support and with your sales teams. If somebody wants to know a little bit about the process uh, in, the, in, the, in the sales uh, negotiation, uh, you can give them some information. Don't divulge the entire process to, uh, to, your, uh, to your sales team or to your, uh, your support people because they'll tell They'll tell the, the customer absolutely everything that has to do with the process. They just need to know the fine lines of what's happening. Uh, and don't put any threatening language in there. It's okay to say your service may be suspended, uh, but talking about, and, and you know, this, this also comes back, and you can, you can say things like termination, but it's only if it's something that is required in the in the notification but you really want to stay stay away from the threatening message because most of the time when you're ticketing a customer for a problem it's not something that they did uh, it's something that maybe they had somebody on usually the person that you're talking with that they may have had somebody on their marketing team that went and bought an email list that they sent out to the internet and it got them blacklisted uh, and they, you start receiving complaints back and forth. So the guy that you're dealing with on, usually on the other side of your, your tickets or your phone calls is not the party who actually caused the issue. So you want to come in with that conversation of we're, we're, not, we're, not trying to, uh, we're not trying to seem like the bad guy here. We're trying to say, here's this problem. Can you fix it? If they can't fix it, you want to make sure that you are able to help them fix it in any way, shape, form, or fashion, which goes back to having that dedicated abuse desk, somebody who's going to understand more about what the problems are that are, that are happening on your network. Uh, and you have to, have to set deadlines with the customers for that remediation. Uh, you can't just let an issue sit there and fester for, for months or weeks. Uh, it just it shouldn't work that way. You you know you have these you have these policies in place, so you have to enforce them, uh, or you're you're only as good as as the uh, actions that you take on what your uh, what you have your processes in place and what you have in your policies. Uh, so the dangers of lack of process. So I you know I'll I'll tell a story in a minute about uh, about rack space. That isn't a it isn't a nice one. Uh, so you you can run into legal issues, uh, and you could just right off the bat terminate a somebody somebody could terminate a customer without let's say they just do it without any notice. But let's say that your acceptable use policy said we'll give you seventy two hours notice uh, of termination. But the guy in support who was just like, well, I just feel like terminating somebody today, just terminates a customer, that makes you legally liable for breaking the contract with your customer. Uh, and you just, you know, what, what are you going to do there? Well, you could get taken to court. You could try and resolve it uh, amicably with the, uh, with the customer direct direct, but that's going to be something where you're probably going to be bringing in your senior leadership and 
you know, it, it's time that they don't want to do. They're busy trying to run the company, trying to uh, improve profit margins and whatever whatever else the leadership does at at, at the company. And uh, it's it's a piece that they, that they shouldn't have to worry about. And also, it, you'll uh, you'll see things uh, retaliation to your network, blacklisting, uh, resource constraints because of because of the retaliations that are happening, and potentially downtime of customer environments. Uh, and you you won't be effectively communicating. Uh, and that's that's a piece that that goes with that dedicated abuse task in this processing is when you're able to effectively communicate and effectively show that this is how this is how we're going to help the customer get to the end of the issue and fix it and we'll we'll get to the end and be be good uh, and you'll you'll be able to keep that clear message uh, and you're just not able to enforce your your acceptable use policy effectively uh, without having processes in place so uh Going to going to build a process, so we'll go and we'll talk about the the spam piece. Uh, so, uh, so here here are some examples of types. Uh, we're going to focus on spam because that uh, that's that's one piece that uh, that was mentioned within the audience. So there's spam, there's spam advertising, there's phishing, there's defaced sites, there's all sorts of just it goes on and on and on and on and on and on and on, and this comes back to talking about specifically what's what's your network, what's your problem, and those are the things that you really need to say. This is what I need to develop a process for. This is what I need to focus on. Uh, so some things some things may be uh, maybe not applicable to you. That's on this that's on this web page, uh, and. At the, at, at, you know, one, one thing that I didn't even think about that, uh, that was actually mentioned to me was, was the rogue DNS part. It's not something that's a problem for, for rack space, but other networks are having a problem with it. Uh, that is a lot smaller than I thought it was going to be. Okay, so uh, when, you're, when you're looking at this process, so you've decided on the type. Uh, you've decided on spam. So... In this tiny, tiny little uh, screenshot, uh, this is this is actually pulled from uh, the the hosting best common practices document that uh, that Mog published a couple of years ago. Uh, what we what we were trying to figure out uh, that over many debates and many discussions was uh, how do you assign urgency, and it's. A little nebulous, and this is really this is not a. I'm not trying to preach the gospel. This is just what we came up with, uh, and what what we really have here is uh, what your what a, what's a critical, what's a high risk, what's a medium risk, what's a low risk, what's very low, uh, and what we have up there at the high risk is child exploitation on your on your network, uh, imminent threat. To uh, to somebody, uh, and then your next your next row down is uh, you have a command and control server on your network that is uh, connecting all all sorts of botnets throughout the world. You have a DDoS that is going to bring your infrastructure down, uh, or uh, I'm trying to remember what what another one was. I can barely read it. Uh, but more or less threats to your infrastructure. So then you go down to your medium, that's a phishing website on your network, malware on your network, uh, um, some type of deface site, things that are trying to uh, take control of other computers or, uh, or steal people's information. Then you get down to, uh, to the lower priorities, which is talking about spam. I know that some people may say, why do you have spam so low? Uh, but in the debates that we were having, it was more or less, I think that, that the stuff that, I, that I've already mentioned is a little bit more critical uh, into protecting that network and protecting what's happening. Uh, so that's, that's pretty much what you can say in this is that, uh, so we've chosen our type, which is spam, and we've chosen our urgency, which is 
in this case, let's just say referencing this, is low. Uh, finally, at the bottom there, uh, we do have a mention of copyright, copyright and trademark issues. So in the United States, we have the Digital Millennium Copyright Act, uh, which I'm not sure if you've received any of those. It's got a, a whole crazy little process with it. And it's something that we as a, as a provider have to take care of. It's a requirement for us. So that's something that we would push up higher. But uh, in other countries, uh, in, in some European countries, it's not, a, it's not an issue. It's a as we get to it, as we're able to resolve it situation. Uh, so that's why we put that all the way down at the bottom and put a little asterisk saying this is something that you may be able to input in, but we're not going to say that it's a high priority because when we do uh, write these documents, we want to try and make sure that we're getting as much input from a worldview, not just not just the, you know these uh, these Americans up in the north uh, that you know we we want to make sure that everybody understands that we want this to be applicable to as many people as possible to as many companies as possible. We don't want everything to look like oh well this is a great great best practice for Amazon, for Google, for Microsoft, for Rackspace. We want to make sure that everybody can use it. If somebody wakes up tomorrow and wants to say, I want to start a hosting company and I want to make sure that I don't have abuse on my network, we want them to be able to reference this document and say, okay, I can do this, 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 and this, and they'd be able to figure it out. So a little, little bit on, uh, on the urgency and some of the thought that came behind us developing that out. So... Gone to urgency, we've decided our type. So now the customer. Uh, since we're talking about spam, it's a low priority. Uh, how long do we want to wait for the customer to respond? Uh, do we want to give them 24 hours? Do we want to give them 72 hours? Uh, and what is an acceptable response? Uh, do you want them to just say, I fixed the issue, I've unsubscribed the user, I've cleaned my list? Uh, and that's a, that's a piece where when you want to focus on the simplicity, you don't want to have every single example that's an acceptable use for, uh, for your customer. You want to have a preferred resolution uh, to an issue, but you don't want to have everything listed out because then your process is going to get as long as Amazon's AUP. And uh, it, it'll help you focus. Did you have a, have a point? Okay. Uh, and after that customer's responded said, hey, I've seen the ticket, I'm working on the issue. How long do you want to give them until they fix that issue? Uh, again, it's all, it's all determinate in where you prioritize uh, the issue and how, you know, how many resources that you have to be able to keep track of, of the things that are happening. Uh, and uh, how, let's say the customer comes and says, I need help with this. Can you log into my server and do this? Okay, first of all, I'm not logging into your server as, a, as an abuse desk uh, technician. Uh, that's something that when we have on our, on our managed side that we would send them to over to our managed support team. And they are able to log into the server with the customer, help them through the issue, help them fix it. Uh, and knowing where to send somebody to when, when they come back and say, I need help. Uh, being able to show them this is the path. Uh, you, got, you have to make sure that when you do hand it off to that team, that you set the expectation with that team. Once you fix the issue, send it back to us. Uh, there's, there's sometimes it still happens at Rackspace is there's sometimes you send a ticket over to a team to help fix an issue and the ticket never comes back. And you don't know that, is it fixed? Is it still a problem? We're no longer receiving complaints, so it may not be a problem, but it could be a problem. Uh, but they happen to be uh, spamming somebody in, uh, uh, in New Zealand, and we don't have any feedback loops in New Zealand. It was just one guy who sent a complaint. Are they still targeting a bunch of people in New Zealand? Uh, so it's making sure that you get back and know that... Uh, that a resolution has happened. There are some cases where you do you you can suspend that notification, and this is also going back to that acceptable use policy and making sure you have that clear language in there. 
uh, you have to say that there are certain times where in order to protect the integrity of the network, we may suspend your server. Uh, we may stop stop this from happening. Uh, and it's it's always important to make sure you do send that notification and then suspend. Uh, in the in in my world, uh, there there are many times where sometimes I've suspended a customer and then forgot to send a notification because I just suspended the thing and then ooh something else happened and started do, doing work. I had the ticket open with the, with everything uh, printed out, but I just didn't like sin and uh that that can lead to you know customers being very upset with why didn't i receive a notification why didn't you tell me about this uh there's there's always going to be people when you suspend it notification even though you notify them they're still going to come in and be very angry with you but you have to make sure that you you set that yes lucy go ahead Right. When you know that activity is really malicious, uh, but sometimes the, your customer may, may be invaded and they are abusing the infrastructure to make some uh, malicious activity. So they was been invaded and put a, a, a phishing page on the website, for example. But in other situations, you 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 know that that customer is doing the malicious activity. Mm -hmm. So how do you, you, you do that? You, you not find the customer in a way knowing that uh, he is the perpetrator itself. It's not uh, uh, that the, the customer was invaded or was being abused. Uh, the guy is doing the malicious activity. So you, you, just, you just suspend it and then you send a notification or you're notified before, but knowing that, okay, that, that's the bad guy. So I'm just saying the bad guy, I'm seeing his activity. How, how do you deal with that? Okay, so, so talking, you're, you're you're kind of talking in the in the frame of let's say that let's just say that this is fraudulent activity on your network. We'll just go from from that just to be, just to be simple because I know that there's there's layers upon layers and we could go on for hours talking about it. So let's just say this is the case of a fraudulent actor on your network. So you have uh, I didn't mention this. Make sure you. Uh, you investigate the customer uh, at the time that you receive the complaint, so you know a little bit about them. Have they received abuse com abuse complaints before? Uh, is it something that they need to? Uh, uh, that, that they, it's a common problem with them that they're keeping on doing it over and over again. So uh, we're going to go the terms terms of let's say you determine that this is a fraudulent customer. Uh, so that's a case that uh, you will suspend their their service immediately and you will send a notice of termination uh, and that's you know that that would be the process for that so you've made the determination of a of reasonable reasonable determination that this is a fraudulent customer now in the case that it's not a fraudulent customer and it's just somebody who can't get their stuff together on the network that's when you 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 get to the point where let's let's say you give everybody three four chances. Uh, let's say they just they have a spam problem uh, on the network and it's their actual marketing messages. It's not somebody that is peddling Viagra or peddling you know here's uh, sign up to win uh, win an iTunes card or a uh, or an Amazon gift card type of type of spam that you see out there. It's just somebody who is promoting their their job website uh, and they just can't can't resolve the issue. You need to come back to them with the final notification of you need to do this, this, and this to be in line with our acceptable use policy. If you do not and this is where I, you know, you really want to stay away from threatening language, but sometimes you have to go there. Uh, and this, this is where we've notified you six times. You have said that you have fixed the issue every time, but we keep on seeing this happen. Either fix these things with the recommendations that we have put in place, or we're going to have to sever that relationship with you. 
Uh, and I usually don't say sever the relationship. I usually say termination because you, you want to make sure that they're taking it seriously and that they're, they're making the, the understanding. Uh, you also have, uh, you also have the case where sometimes you may notify somebody and they will come back and curse you out with every single word in the book, uh, and call you and try to yell at you. And you as a, you as a company, uh, you you don't you shouldn't have to deal with that. That shouldn't be something that should be part of of what you're doing. Yes, you're going to run into people that are upset that there's a problem on their system that you've suspended them or that you've sent them a not notice of, of suspension. But when you do have an abusive customer who's abusive to not just your team but your sales team, your chat team, and your uh, your customer support. That that's also another case where you may uh, you may want to get rid of that relationship. You do want to let them know that this is why we're doing it. This is why we can't have you with us. Yes, sir. Lucas Moura from the Lacnic sponsorship program. Uh, sometimes the customer is hosting a fraudulent activity, but he did not know. For example, a, a old WordPress version like a clip. And do you know, like, or do you have some like examples of good um, uh, best practices to like some kind of documentation or like a page with uh, relevant content about this kind of activity? How, oh, for example, you are hosting a phishing website, and uh, how to tell the customer that he is hosting this kind, and maybe uh, further uh, how to teach him. Uh, how to remove this kind of content yeah, without using like your own resource. Sometimes mm -hmm. you are a small hosting uh, company and you don't have like a dedicated uh, team to remove all the phishings and problems. Mm -hmm. And uh, do you think that, that this is a good option? Like uh, give it this kind of knowledge to the customer and he makes with his own hands the removal of the content? Yes. So uh, we, uh, you know, we we usually don't uh, remove the issue for the customer. Uh, we this is this is a case of customer comes back and says, "I need help," and that's when we send it to our support. And that, of course, they have more resources than us, but they have put together a uh, more or less recommendations on on what you can do, where you need to look. Uh, most of the most of the time, when it comes to WordPress. Yay, WordPress. Uh, it's, uh, it's one of those cases of you need to update that software uh, and, and make a removal. And uh, so there isn't necessarily a, a full document out there, but uh, it's something that uh, I would love to have, uh, have the conversation to let's see if there's something that we can work together and help you develop. So we can build that out and say, okay, here's here's the here's the playbook for uh, for stopping somebody who has a bad WordPress or Joomla or whatever site uh, on their system. So yeah, we have one developed, but it's you know it's internal to to what Rackspace has. Uh, I'm not aware of a specific best practices document. No, I don't. No. I don't think there's a specific uh, one. One thing that I would, that I would uh, suggest is there's an organization in Europe which is called CMS Garden. Um, just Google it. I don't know if it's DE or whatever top level domain. Um, and they can help in updating uh, WordPresses before something's happening. So they're, these are the people that are um, um, looking for all the security holes in WordPress and uh, all the other um, um, CMS systems. Yeah, just to, just to... Sorry, I thought yeah. I'm loud enough, but um, no. Um, so CMS Garden is an organization in Europe, um, and uh, these are developers of all the CMS systems, and they collect all the threats and all the, uh, the, the problems that these CMS systems have, and they push um, actively updates to hosting companies or ISPs or people that are using uh, these systems. So that is something that we have seen a lot of improvement uh, in, in not even being compromised. But if you are, if you have a, a customer who has a WordPress problem, it's always a little bit depending on your process. So what can you do? What do you want to do? 
if you're hosting WordPresses for free and no, your customers more or less not paying, you can more or less block port 80 and 443 and send them an email and say, hey, we blocked it because you're hosting a phishing site and we, we just stopped it. If it's, you know, if you're selling it to businesses, you can't do that. So it really depends a little bit on, 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 how, you are, uh, on how you're looking at it. Um, but fixing WordPresses actively is super hard. So mm -hmm. that's yeah. that's an unsolved problem, I would say. Yeah, and and there's also there's also uh, there's also a company out there uh, called Patchman that uh, they uh, they have a solution out there where they will they you don't have to do it. They'll update all of the WordPresses uh, on on your system. And also the other thing that happens is they. Uh, the, the big problem that you have when uh, when you're saying, okay, customer, you need to update your WordPress. Well, I've got this plugin that this guy wrote 20 years ago, well, let's, let's, five years ago, for WordPress version 1.0, and I know that we're on version version 4 something or 5 something now, uh, and they're afraid that if we update, it's no longer going to work. Uh, with the uh, with the Patchman, uh, what it does is it still makes sure it still makes sure that it works. It applies all of the security to the system, and uh, and is able to to update. It's we can I can share that with you. Uh, and uh, the the other thing that you can also consider with WordPress is a web application firewall, uh, and what that does is. It's only a mitigation technique. It's not something that's, it doesn't fix the problem. But you're able to say, okay, we've just put this in this box over here, and they're not going to, it's not going to be malicious anymore. It's not going to be serving up the, uh, the website. Uh, and there's, there's, a free, uh, there's a free version of it out there uh, called uh, Mod Security. Mod Security is what it's called. Uh, and once again, can share that with you. Uh, and yeah, one thing, the NS Garden also provides um, um, web, uh, web application firewall rules. So if they can't fix something really, really fast, they will offer you the uh, the rule set for the web application firewall, and then you will become or you will get the um, um, the update later on. Yeah. Uh, did, uh, did did that help you? Yeah, okay. for sure. Uh, but it's also quite common to like a company. Um, for example, a store that sells squirrels, and uh, he like the, the the owner asked to his nephew to make the website and like and to go to the nephew goes abroad for and uh, the website it's abandoned, but the owner still wants to have it, but it's quite <laughs> We've got another mic for you right there. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, it's quite hard to like keep the site uh, website updated, and it's quite hard to contact the owner. You know, so maybe it's a legacy problem. And I don't know if you have this uh, kind of uh, documents in Moc also like the legacy problems with not just Word, uh, WordPress, but but also legacy infrastructure from uh, other small hosting companies. Yeah, like it's it. it's it's always the it's always the the recommendation that uh, if there's the ability to update automatically, switch that on, uh, and and that'll that helps uh, mitigate some of that. And yes, there are going to be times where you're going to have somebody that just can't can't do that type of thing. And you have to get to the point as a company where can we still host these guys or not? And, you know, I, I know that it's a difficult decision because uh, the problem that you run into when you're doing, doing anti-abuse on your network is there's going to be so many people out there that look at it and say, you're just terminating all of our customers and causing a lot of churn. And that's not what you're doing. You're trying to help customers be safe so they're able to spend all the money on your network and grow their business. Uh, and, yeah, you know, there's, there's going to be times where you're not going to be able to help somebody. And that's, that's when you just come to that difficult decision of do we keep you on our network or do we just make you remove that site? Uh, so that's you know we'll we'll uh, let's let's have some some discussions about let's build something for uh, for 
the LACNIC region to talk about website updating, to talk about WordPress issues. Uh, and we'll talk about the things that we just talked about with the uh, with the garden, with uh, Patchman, and with uh, Mod Security. Those are some of the, and these are not ultra expensive options for you as well. So you're not going to be uh, you're not going to be worrying about. I have to come to my my employer with here's this you know million dollar thing. So so yeah, you know the the Mod Security thing is free. So, but anyways, yeah, let's uh, let's let's make sure that we collaborate on that. Uh, I would love to be able to talk with uh, with Lucy about that. Okay. Okay. So actually, we come back to after after talking about uh, about uh, getting rid of a uh, of a customer, unfortunately. Uh, you have to have something in that process that talks about non-compliance. Because uh, sometimes customers going to come back to you and say, I'm not doing anything wrong, but they've gotten an entire uh, block of your IPs blacklisted. How are you not doing anything wrong and you're getting us blacklisted absolutely everywhere on the Internet? Uh, so uh, what do you do there? You, Everything up into termination. Uh, sometimes, uh, when you don't when you don't hear back from that customer, uh, you just you have to suspend them, uh, and because you don't know as that provider that they fix the issue. Because uh, in some cases, you don't have visibility into everything that they're doing, and you want to keep it that way because you want to build the trust with your customer that. We're not going to be spying on you. We're not going to look at everything that you're doing on your network. We just want you to be happy using our services, pay us a lot of money, and grow so you can pay us more money. Uh, and uh, there's there's other options in here when you do not see uh, a response from a customer. It's not all. It doesn't always end in termination or suspension. Sometimes you can throw a mitigation on that, and that's some. That's in some cases when the web application firewall piece comes in. You're able to take a piece of WordPress. Let's say it's a bad theme in WordPress, and you're able to just block that piece. Now again, that's a mitigation. That's not a complete resolution to the problem, but you're able to stop the issue at hand. Uh, and the other thing that you want to do in that case when you've applied something like a web application firewall to a customer is uh, you want to make sure that it's not spreading throughout their throughout their site. And when it does when it does start to do something like spread, that's when you have to run up with this suspension. Uh, and then finally, you know, the, the termination is something that's going to happen when you don't get that compliance. Uh, so. Uh, also, when you're going to be making these uh, these grand suspensions and terminations of customers, make sure that there are no special management guidelines for the customer. Make sure that you're not uh, going to send a termination notice to the largest customer on your network uh, without consulting, let's just say, I don't know, your CEO might want to know if you're going to uh, terminate somebody who's providing 20% of your revenue. Uh, you you want to make sure that uh, there are there are some some exceptions to these to these rules. Not everything always goes in place. Uh, I would love to to think about you know the the customer that's paying us five five dollars a month and the customer that's paying us uh, five hundred thousand dollars a month that I can treat them the same, but you just can't. You have to think about it from a business perspective, but. The ultimate goal is to always make sure that the customer does fix the issue. There's just sometimes that you're going to be looking at it in some ways and saying, "We have to make we have to give a little bit of leeway to this guy." Uh, but you do sometimes have to have the car hard conversation with those big customers. But make sure you get the leadership involved because sometimes hearing from the CEO is all that that customer needs to say this needs to be fixed now. And sometimes people will just go and fix it. Sometimes they won't. It's just a case by case type of thing. Uh, and finally, you, you need to have a have a process for closing. There are some times when a customer won't respond to a ticket of ours. Uh, let's say we send them a phishing website. 
make sure that you uh, you confirm that the, that the phishing website is still up when uh, when you're going to suspend a customer. Sometimes they take them down, uh, and they just they they go they see the ticket they take the phishing website down or they they got a notification personally from somebody saying you've got a phishing website. So that's a case of oh they've fixed the issue it's no problem. Make sure though when you send that uh, that final update closing out a ticket with the customer that you say okay we've we've realized that the phishing website has been taken down and that this is no longer an issue we are going to go ahead and close the ticket. But Please note that violations of our policies should require, well, in ours, we require a response. Uh, so what we say is in the case that we don't receive a response and we see a re resolution, we tell them that any time that you receive a ticket from us that is talking about an issue, even if you resolve the problem, we require that response, and it could result in termination uh, when you receive one of these tickets and we don't hear from you. Because there are many times where we don't even know if they fixed an issue or not because, again, the visibility into the environment. So that's, that's one important thing to, to think about when you've seen an issue resolve. Look back and see, you know, is this a common occurrence with them? Do they just not like to respond to tickets? Uh, is it something that you need to give them a the phone call, see how they're doing? Uh, you know, just make sure that make sure that the problem's resolved, uh, and make sure that the customer knows the policies and the guidelines that they they have agreed to. Because again, nobody reads acceptable use policies; they're pretty boring. Uh, unless it's something that you do every day, you're kind of like, "I'm glad that we have that line in there. That's great. I love our indemnification clause." Uh, it just it gives me a warm fuzzy. Uh, some some people are just like that's why why do you like a legal document? But uh, you know it's uh, yeah it's this is this is more or less you know how you how you would run through through a process and uh, you know talking about your mitigation and your your resolution. So there is a a talk between remediation and mitigation. You can close out an issue with me, with uh, with mitigation in place, but you do want to make sure that there's something in uh, something in your notes that says this customer still has an active issue on their network. We closed out the issue because it's been mitigated either by us or by the customer, but it's still an active problem. Uh, you don't want to keep a ticket open forever and ever and ever uh, when when a when a mitigation technique is in place, because it could be something that they're able to mitigate long term. Uh, let's say somebody is sending out spam from their network, and they didn't know that they had uh, a postfix installation on their on their system, and they just shut that down. Uh, that's you can say that that's mitigation, but that's more like a resolution, uh, and it's it's dependent on do they want to send email or do they not want to send email? Are they planning to send email? So if it's something where they're like, well, we do want to send email, uh, but we're going to shut down Postfix for now, that's a mitigation in place. They're going to bring that back online. The thing that you want to be cognizant of is when they do bring that back online, have they put the things in place to make sure that they're secure? Uh, and then finally, the, the remediation. That means issue's been fixed, they've figured out the problem, they've made sure that this isn't going to be something that will happen again based on what we currently fixed, because there's always other holes and things. So uh, we're going to go ahead and, uh, and break now. And... Uh, Tobias and I, uh, we're going to probably just grab a coffee and we'll be right back up here. So if anybody does have questions during the break, please feel free to come up and, and ask us questions and we will answer everything that, th that we want. So we're going to start back up here in 30 minutes, 30, let's, let's make it, we'll make it 11 o'clock is when we'll start again. Okay.